Everybody, so we're going to go ahead and get started now uh, since it's 12 and, and this will be about a 25, 30 minute presentation. So go ahead and grab a seat and we'll get started in just a minute. <clears throat> Okay, so hello folks. Can everybody hear me okay? Excellent. All right, so I'm Vince Kenny. I'm a computer scientist with the FBI. So I work here in Salt Lake City for the Salt Lake City Division of the FBI. And today I'd like to tell maybe less of a technical presentation, but more of a story-based presentation about kind of the, the whole element of cybercrime and organized cybercrime. So feel free to ask any questions during or after the presentation. Um, but let's go ahead and get started. So, <clears throat> just to kind of cover our bases here, first thing to talk about is kind of the different roles in the federal government when it comes to cybersecurity. And the way I look at it, if you break it down into three large chunks, there is the Department of Homeland Security, there is the Department of Justice, and there is the DOD. And so the analogy that I'll use, if you kind of compare these three, is if a cyber event is kind of like a house fire, at the end of the day, the DHS, they're like the fire department. So the fire department's job is to come in and put the fire out, but more importantly, the fire department sets up fire safety codes and actually tries to prevent the fire from happening to begin with. Now, if you think of that fire as who started the fire, who was the arson that was responsible for that fire, well, then you call in the police. And so the DOJ is kind of like the police. Our job is primarily to go in and investigate that fire and to try and prevent further fires being started from that particular arson. And then finally, the final leg of this is the DOD. Well, if you think of that fire as started from a, a military or a foreign government, then you're going to have the military come in and, and be involved in trying to stop that fire or stop further fires from that adversary. And that's what the DOD does. They are the military arm. So they are that offensive arm that goes after nation states primarily that are, that are causing different types of cybercrime incidents. But they'll also go after some of these high profile cyber criminal organizations that we'll be talking about. So the makeup of an FBI Salt Lake City or just an FBI cyber task force is a pretty diverse task force. Um, it starts out with a supervisory special agent and then there are a handful of different special agents. On our squad, there are eight different special agents dedicated and, and uh, specifically working cyber security uh, and cyber crimes. But then there are a number of different other positions. There's a position like one that I'm in, which is a computer scientist. I'm primarily a technical resource, so I'll do things like malware analysis, data analysis, and other different types of technical things. And then we have other different positions, a data analyst, that individual will massage the data, a staff operations specialist, they kind of work as an analyst type of role, and then an intel analyst. Their job is to communicate that information throughout the intelligence community. So it's a fairly diversified squad and fairly diversified uh, series of, of different skill sets that go into that squad. The other thing that we have that's very important to us is various different partnerships. So partnerships are really important to the FBI because that's what gives us kind of eyes and ears and also a feedback loop on what's going on. So we have partnerships with various different Utah Department of uh, Public Safety individuals that come and sit on our squad, as well as partnerships with other, other different local and federal government agencies that work with us. Now the kind of topic that I'll be talking about is this organized crime or this kind of cyber crime incorporated component. And when I'm really talking about that, I'm, I'm talking about cyber criminal efforts, which the distinction is we have kind of two different veins that we'll put cyber activity into. One is the nation state activity, which those nation state actors aren't necessarily motivated by anything other than espionage or other different geopolitical reasons. And then you've got the cyber criminal focus, which is individuals that are primarily financially motivated. So they're trying to make a business out of this. And I know when I started years ago, uh, when you think of those financially motivated individuals, they were trying to make a quick buck. But throughout this presentation, hopefully I'll show that that has definitely evolved from being a quick buck to now an, an actual business model, essentially. And then also what the FBI is doing to try and disrupt those business models. 
So without further ado, I'll go ahead and begin this presentation just centering around organized crime. So like I mentioned, this is primarily a story-based presentation just to talk about two different types of organized crime. On the left here, you have uh, the Kali Cartel. So who here has watched the Narcos series? Yeah, so about 50% of my information came from, from that Netflix Narcos series. So I'm, I'm not an expert on, on the Cali Cartel, but point being said is that if you look back in the 1980s, one of the biggest issues with organized crime was around drugs. And it was around a lot of these foreign, foreign individuals, primarily in Colombia and South America, who were, uh, who were you know, causing these drug problems. So for today, we're going to actually go ahead and focus on not only the Kali cartel, but also compare this to the Conti group. Who's heard of the Conti group before? Okay, they were definitely a big, big ransomware player, certainly throughout the pandemic, and then they kind of fizzled out um, <clears throat> throughout the end of it. So let's go ahead and talk. Hmm. Okay, there we go. Sorry, just the words uh, kind of <clears throat> went away for just a minute. So let's go ahead and talk briefly about the Kali cartel. Well, they kind of gained an, a reputation as being the gentlemen of Cali. And so the reason why they were gentlemen of Cali is they tried to frame this cocaine business into a business model, meaning that they were, you know, hosting various different things. They had kind of a different type of structure that went into it. It wasn't just a street level type of thing. But that being said, they had to come from somewhere. So I've, in fact, actually, these individuals, they started out their business through uh, high profile kidnappings which is very far from a, you know, distinguished businessman. That's definitely a much grittier, dirtier business to be a part of. So they shifted away from that, um, that kidnapping component uh, to the drug business. And they actually took a lot of the money that they got from the kidnapping component of their business and turned that into sort of the seed money to start their drug empire. And in particular, they had a really strong connection with various different individuals in New York City. So New York City was kind of one of their main hubs of how they were able to facilitate their drug empire. Now we compare the Conti group. So Conti is a very interesting group in the aspect that it's really started through various different groups over the past decade or longer. And when you think of two major groups that sort of were there before Conti, you think of the group Wizard Spider and Ryuk. So Wizard Spider is kind of a larger conglomerate of different individuals that are part of that group that do various different types of crime. Ryuk was kind of a, a ransomware campaign, and it was more associated with ransomware in general. But Wizard Spider, they started out not through ransomware, but through banking trojans. How many people here remember banking trojans? Yeah, th this is kind of like a blast from the past. Uh, those aren't quite as common nowadays. They still exist a little bit, but this group started out with banking Trojans, and that was kind of their money that they, that they eventually turned that into other different forms of businesses. And then Ryuk came along, and that, like I said, was primarily specialized around ransomware. So when Conti eventually came around, they kind of had a few different go at, the, go at uh, different types of business models to try and organize their group. So now the organized structure. So the organized structure for uh, the Cali cartel, well, there was definitely a leadership component. There were a couple different leaders, in particular the Rodriguez brothers, uh, but also there was the Santa Cruz family that helped sort of structure that. But throughout that organized structure, what you'll see is that they tried to run that business like a Fortune 500 company. They had different types of buildings that had different types of accounting departments, HR departments, other different ty types of things to also try and you know, mix the illegitimate components of the business with legitimate components of the business. So money laundering was a very big component of being able to take the profits from drugs and pour it into some legitimate type of business. When you look at the Conti group, they had kind of a similar organized crime structure in the aspect that they were kind of like a startup. They had a top level boss. They had various different departments, um, even departments centered around training, HR, payroll, different types of things. They even acquired different types of property and real estate that people would, would use sort of on a full time basis. 
But that group formed uh, essentially like a criminal business that you might see as sort of a cybersecurity company here in the United States. There were coders, testers, administrators, reverse engineers, pen testers, lots of different technical people that supported different phases throughout these ransomware campaigns. Now, any group needs a leader, and the leader of the Cali group was an individual named Gilberto Rodriguez, and he gained a reputation as being kind of the chess player, meaning that he had a very strategic role in the Conti group, where he was known not only for his ability to run the business, but he was also known for his ability to use things like corruption and influence to be able to further this business and try to make it look at least legitimate, at least in his sort of hometown to some degree. So he was very, very clever, and also he was a lawyer, so he had a law degree. So he kind of understood how to actually run a business. Um, so <clears throat> it's very interesting. The leadership in Conti. So the Conti leadership was run by an individual codenamed Stern. Uh, so he kind of got that name Stern because he wasn't necessarily known as the most technical individual, but he was known as a very, very, very strong-handed and uh, taskmaster type of individual. Uh, if you got a task from Stern, you had to complete it, and he made sure that those things happened. So he gained really reputation for his organizational management rather than just purely his technical skills. Now the criminal ecosystem. So another big component of a successful business is good opportunities or an ecosystem that helps flourish that business. So one of the things that led to the Kali Group being able to be successful was not only the downfall of Pablo Escobar, but also the trying to position themselves as an opposite to Pablo Escobar. So Pablo Escobar used violence as a very strong mean to sort of get what he wanted. He was known as an individual that if you defied him, he would use a lot of violence against you. The Kali group, they used corruption. That was their big thing. They really tried to use corruption and partnerships to make things move forward. But that criminal ecosystem really back in the 1980s allowed them to sort of flourish this business because there weren't that many rules and they were dealing with kind of the separation of the United States was used to combating drug problems here locally in the United States and it turned out that the drug problems really were stemming from overseas. <clears throat> so go figure, when you're talking about ransomware problems, the FBI in the United States, we're pretty good about going after individuals that are here locally in the United States, but it certainly creates some challenges and hurdles if those individuals are in foreign countries, especially foreign countries that we might not be able to work with so closely. So <clears throat> one of the things that really led to the success of, of why Conti was able to do its operations was a major change that happened throughout the world. So what happened in 2020 that was a major change? COVID. <laughs> so COVID essentially was kind of this component that really led to more growth and opportunity for Conti to run wild. And the reason why was individuals were connecting to the internet and had to change their own businesses to be in this remote type of state. Another thing that was important for the growth of Conti <clears throat> was a profit component of that meaning that cryptocurrencies, the rise of using virtual currencies as a medium of trading, and also a medium of getting large amounts of money, really led to the success of Conti running these big game operations. So the big game operations are, they go after a very large target rather than these small one-off, two-off types of, types of approaches. So there were a couple things that had to really happen for Conti to be successful. And, um, <clears throat> and so yeah, we saw a few of these different things happen over the past couple of years. All right, now getting into the rise and the fall. So this is kind of the rise. So like I mentioned, the main thing that the Kali cartel, they were able to do is they were able to use, um, they were able to infil infiltrate various different key sectors. So they were able to infiltrate various different political organizations, law enforcement organizations, and generally subvert justice in general in uh, Colombia to be able to run their business. And then they had various different business fronts to try and legitimize their business, or at least give their business a legitimized facelift, so to speak. 
The thing with the Kali or, or the Conti group is that they were really known for big game hunting. So they changed this ransomware component that changed from you know 2014 to 2020, and then 2020 and moving forward. This big game hunting really was we're going to go after large targets that might be more challenging to infiltrate and might require more sophistication, but the reward out of this is to receive um, you know, a much larger amount of money from the extortion campaign. They also pioneered this double and triple extortion. So double and triple extortion would be a ransomware campaign has happened, the individual refuses to pay the ransom because they've got a backup or they just don't want to pay it. They will then extort them further by stating that we've stolen your data and we're going to release it if you don't uh, pay this ransom. And then they'd go even further by contacting customers of that particular group and harassing those customers, saying that we have obtained this sensitive data from this group and they're not doing anything about this. They're leaving you behind. Now, <clears throat> when we think of kind of the disruption component of it, one of the strongest disruption components that kind of goes into these is obviously arresting or actually putting charges on the individuals. But another component that caused a lot of heartburn for the Kali group was seizures. So seizures of the drugs, the product, and seizures of money. So seizures is actually something that we have started to incorporate a lot more in our ransomware cases, trying to not only go after the individuals, but go after their stuff, essentially. If we can't really find a pain point with them by arresting them, maybe we can find a pain point by taking their money, by seizing their infrastructure. Now, Conti, they had a few big incidents. That big game hunting puts them in a much riskier place. So they had two very interesting incidents that happened, one on May 21st that targeted the Irish health service executive, um, and then the other one that happened to the Costa Rican, go uh, Costa Rican government. So <clears throat> these instances actually elevated their status as being just a criminal threat to being a matter of national security. So that was one of the mistakes that they make, is they, they basically got too, too, too greedy and went after too big of targets that they started to move up in this radar. It almost be somewhat comparable to back in the 1980s, some of these drug kings and cartels started working with communist countries to facilitate their drugs and the communist countries sp split the profits. That almost made it move from being, hey, these are drug dealers and this is a drug organization to these individuals are working with communist countries, and this has moved into a matter of national security. So the US government therefore put a reward on their head of $10, $10 million. <clears throat> now we're kind of leading to the downfall. So this is kind of an interesting component of the Kali group that also was shared with the Conti group, or rather the Kali cartel, where the, Ka the Conti cartel, or, or the Kali cartel rather, had a whistleblower that basically caused the whole cartel to kind of crumble from within. So Jorge Salasoto, he uh, was an engineer and a high-level individual within that Kali, Kali cartel, and he grew disillusioned with the, the, the cartel. He kind of felt like he was making money, but he wasn't receiving some other different forms of security and other things that he wanted with that group. So he decided to pivot and actually work with the federal government, and that led to a major, major disruption of the Kali group, or the Kali cartel. Another thing that happened with the Conti group was the leaks uh, of a whole bunch of different chats. So I remember when this came out, there was a, a leak of, you know, uh, hundreds of different types of chat pages of how this Conti group uh, was organized and how they worked. And this was a really, really interesting thing to sort of read through, because you literally were reading through like daily stand-ups. You were literally reading through like progress reports. You were reading through all these different sort of business components that gave away lots and lots of information, especially different financial information, where they eventually stored money, where they eventually spent money on different types of infrastructure. So that was a huge blow to the Conti group, was the release of um, a bunch of their chatting information of their business by uh, an affiliate who was disgruntled with this group. And then finally, the fall. So uh, obviously with the rise and now the fall, the arrest of Gilberto Rodriguez 
and, uh, and other different leaders of the Kali group led to that fall that started um, <clears throat> to really, you know, dissipate the, the influence that the Kali cartel had in that drug organization. And the fall of Conti, well, one of the things, like I said, even though there were no arrests that were made for the Conti group, one of the things that caused them to fall was actually the allegiance that they pled to the Russian government during uh, that period of time when, the, when Russia initially invaded Ukraine, and is still in Ukraine, obviously. So one of the things that that elevated it to was it elevated it from being just this organized crime group to someone who was supporting the Russian government. And that was kind of like all hell sort of broke loose for them, so to speak. Um, they had to backtrack that statement, but at the end of the day, that really, um, you know, kind of caused their operation to fall apart completely. So like I said, there was just this general series of different missteps that they had. They ran a fairly long campaign, but throughout that whole process, we were able to poke holes and disrupt various different things. There were many cryptocurrency seizures that, were ha that happened, various different takedowns of different types of infrastructure, and so uh, that eventually led to Conti shutting down at least that particular campaign in May of 2022. So throughout all this, and kind of the conclusion to this, well, there are a lot of similarities that went into the Cali cartel and the Conti group. At the end of the day, it's organized crime. It's just a different vector of organized crime. I think one of the differences when I look at something like ransomware versus um, you know, cocaine and, and drugs is that Cali's product at the end of the day, they had these willing victims, even though they were being victimized by consuming these products, these willing victims to take those products. Whereas Conti's group, they were repulsed by the, that product. You know, no company obviously wants to receive ransomware. And so as a result, I feel like there is some, some component where, you know, there is aspects of the FBI going out and talking with different companies, going out and talking to different individuals to try and move these things forward. And the second reason is because of many of you, the security engineering group. As far as when I'm talking about the Conti group, I can't emphasize how incredibly valuable it is to work with various different security companies on some of these ransomware campaigns and, and combating some of these cyber organized crime efforts. So the thing that I really want to emphasize is that's maybe one of the biggest difference when you look at law enforcement in the 1980s to law enforcement today, especially versus, you know, comparing to drugs to cyber crime, is in the 1980s it was very much limited to the federal government and the military kind of work together to help take down groups like this Cali cartel. Today, if you look at that chart and you see that there is the DHS, the DOJ, and the DOD, well, there's actually kind of a secret fourth leg in there, and that is the private sector. Like I said, I can't tell you how useful it's been to work with private sector companies that have different ideas and capabilities to be able to use and wield to take some of these group groups down. So thank you very much. That is the conclusion of this presentation. Are there any questions from here? Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, alphabet soup. Yeah, so I, I kind of look at it, like I kind of said in that initial analogy, I look at it as there is this kind of chronic problem and different government agencies have different big sticks, essentially. It's sort of like the big stick for the FBI is we're like the police. We'll go after and try to arrest and use criminal prosecution on that. So it kind of depends what type of situation you're dealing with. If you're dealing with a victim where their number one issue is they would just want to mitigate this issue and they want to try and resolve it, it might be a situation where working with DHS might provide that um, as, as far as they provide sort of instant response types of services. As far as kind of the overlapping component of the federal government in cybersecurity, sure, the federal government is huge. There are some inefficiencies that kind of go on with it. But I do think that we really try to have this mindset of 
trying to leverage other different federal agencies in, and use their strengths to move certain things forward. So it's less, you know, maybe 10, 20 years ago when cybercrime was a brand new thing, it maybe was a little bit of a who's going to help work this. Now the roles have been more defined so that if you do have a ransomware attack and you contact the FBI, we come in and we know how to facilitate stuff that will help us, but we also know how to facilitate stuff that might help CISA or might help Secret Service or might help other government agencies because we work with them a lot. Thank you. Go ahead. Yeah, it's a good question. You know, at the end of the day, I think one of the things that has changed a little bit from 2020 to now is this aspect that um, they might not do as many of these big game hunting components of it. So in short, to answer your question, do you think those groups have gone away? No, they're still out there, but it's similar in nature to kind of like these large drug organizations that were very hierarchical. They became very you know, distributed to some degree. That's really the push that we're making is to make it less of a hierarchical type of organization where the barrier of entry is very easy, meaning that there's a couple of leaders who are able to pull in low-level individuals to pushing back on that so that it's very difficult to make this hierarchical type of organization. So it's still a persistent problem, but obviously we're pushing more to make it so that the barrier of entry to get into ransomware is more and more difficult. Go ahead. Yeah, so when I think about private sector engagement and private sector work when you're, when you're an FBI office that's working a ransomware event, um, essentially, I think probably one of the strongest things that we get from the private sector is more or less a feedback of various different victims and how victims are either mitigating it or how victims are being compromised. One of the challenges we have with ransomware is there's a pretty low victim reporting. We might have a ransomware variant that has, you know, 2,000 victims, but only 200 of them have actually reported it. So there is that component, but I also kind of feel like I know a lot of security researchers who have developed clever and interesting solutions to try and target various different types of infrastructure. For example, some ransomware groups, they like to use their extortion means, um, or rather their means of sharing extorted data through like the BitTorrent network. I've worked with security researchers that are like, hey, you know, BitTorrent isn't anonymized. You can see things if you dig a little bit further. So things like that, just tips that can assist law enforcement with that disruption element, because that's our big stick. We can, we can actually shut these individuals down, shut their infrastructure down, seize their cryptocurrencies, things like that. Security researchers, they might be just limited to the observational kind of component of it. Any other questions? Time? Okay. Thank you all so much. If you have any questions, feel free to come up and talk to me afterwards. <laughs>